Okie dokie, oh. a podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 145. It is also our penultimate episode within the Gospel series for Okie Dokie Most, the second to last time that we will be discussing the Gospels together, Paul. Uh, it has been a a long journey, hasn't it? Well, I was going to say something like, man, it seems like we just started, but that is not true. <laughs> We've been going at this a long time. Honesty is a virtue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just a quick recap so that we can give ourselves the most amount of time to get in the text for this week. We see uh, an account in John where Thomas, within the evangelical church, is called the doubter. He wasn't present in the previous encounters of the resurrected Jesus with the apostles, and Jesus shows him shows himself again to his disciples when Thomas is present. And this is especially pertinent when Thomas says previously, like, unless I see him physically, unless I get to touch his wounds, like, I will not believe that he is resurrected. And Jesus meets his need, and he's like, really, like, prove that I'm not a, a ghost. Like, put your hands in the nail holes. Don't disbelieve, but believe. Thomas gives this really great exclamation of equating Jesus not just with Messiahship, but God himself by saying, my Lord and my God. And um, we need to give Thomas more credit for bridging that gap. And it's in Jesus not just being the Messiah that he's waited for his whole life, but actually God personified, uh, which is really important. When he believes... He yeah. really believes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping off the deep end. That's right. Yeah, so, and then we left off um, with a scene at the Sea of Tiberias where Simon, the sons of De- Zebedee, and two others were together fishing, and Jesus is on the shore. At first, they don't know it's him, and they had just fished all night, and Jesus in his disguise, ask him, did you catch anything? No. And Jesus, very similarly to what we see in the beginning of the Gospels, when he calls the disciples, he's like, cast your net on this specific side. And they get so many fish that they're hardly able to to haul it in. Uh, but miraculously, the nets weren't breaking. And we yeah. see it was kind of a cliffhanger where they come to the shore. Jesus has, they realize that it's the Lord. And then they come to the shore with Jesus having a charcoal fire ready for them. And Jesus has just asked them to bring some of the fish that they had just caught. Yeah, we did, didn't we? We kind of stopped right in the middle of that story. So, yeah, let's pick up. uh, Where are we at? John chapter 21, verses 12 to 14. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dare to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Okay, so Jesus tells them to bring some of their catch, and then he invites them to to eat. And so... I know we kind of touched on these questions before, but again, what are what exactly are we supposed to think here? What image should we have in our head? Is is Jesus cooking up a a bunch of fish? Did he have a bunch of bread? I mean, is is Jesus cleaning fish or are they cleaning fish? Is that even a part of what they do? Is, is everybody kind of cooking their own? I mean, how big was this fire after all? It's so many things. Is is Jesus really trying to get them to cook their own stuff, or is he merely sharing from what he'd already had cooking, and or, 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 or is he you know waiting until they've cooked their stuff later or something? I mean, 
We don't really know. It's it's I'm very, very not detailed and probably on purpose. We don't really care about it. But when you're trying to paint that mental image, you could come up with just a bunch of questions. Seemingly, though, through all of this, Jesus remains somewhat unrecognizable. And maybe we could say at least by appearance. And what I mean is, it, it says they knew it was the Lord. And yet, it also says that none of them dared ask, who are you? So there's there's still some unsureness in there. So something about him remains unrecognizable. So again, they all know it's him, but apparently, I don't know, maybe it doesn't look or sound like him. And none of them, none of them has the boldness or the courage to ask. And I'd like to point out, especially who, Samuel? Uh, the the disciple with the most chutzpah, Peter. Yeah, not even Peter. No boldness there, no courage there. So here is probably a, a good indicator that something is off with Peter. Probably has been for quite some time since he denied him or whatever, but something's off. Now, John doesn't say it explicitly, but when Jesus starts passing out the bread and fish, maybe I'm thinking back to similar to the Emmaus story. I bet you there's something that seems very familiar. Kind of like when he was feeding the multitude or kind of like when he had other meals with them together, maybe even like their last meal, the last supper together. And we know that they said a blessing as they started a meal and and Jesus had his way. And so he may have said the blessing, probably said the blessing and probably did it in a manner that was very familiar to them. But then after all of this, we get down to that uh, verse 14 and it says, this is the third time that Jesus was revealed. So somewhere in here, Somewhere in the midst of this story, even though it's like they know it's him, but yeah, they're not 100% sure it's him, whatever, somehow, some way, Jesus is in fact revealed to the disciples. Now, for what it's worth, when John says this was the third time, this is a counting according to John's gospel. So if you, if you think that you get a different count or whatever, I mean, just focus. We're only in one place here. Now, in this little scene, as far as we know, it was only seven of the apostles, the uh, seven of the 11 that were left. And so, you know, we, we still have that question. Did he remain physically unrecognizable? And they just knew that somehow the revealing made it clear? Or, or did he actually begin to look like himself, sound like himself, whatever? Uh, did he become recognizable after he said the blessing and passed out the food? you know, kind of like we saw in the Emmaus story or not. I, we, we just don't know. But either way, John is presenting this, and this is the important part. Jesus was revealed. So John is presenting this as a reliable witness, a reliable testimony of Jesus appearing alive after his death and burial. So, I don't know, kind of some interesting, important stuff in there. Samuel, anything? No, that's good storytelling. All right. Well, let's see what happens next. We'll move on to John 21, verse 15. Oh, we're getting into some good stuff now. Here we go, Samuel. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. All right, that didn't sound like we read a lot, but we got a lot to talk about, Samuel. So continuing the story, they all finish up eating and Jesus starts talking directly to Peter. At this point, it appears that they're, they're all together while Jesus is speaking to Peter. I mean, if, if you're just, Going by this text right here, you, you might think that they're, they're all together while Jesus is talking to Peter. However, as we get a little further down, Samuel, we're going to see that that's not so. 
and and it, it appears that they're taking a little walk together. They're separated from the group. But again, we'll see that later. For now, we should just picture Jesus and Peter being more alone together, okay? Now, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these? So the question, Samuel, is, well, who is these? Who's he talking about? Got a guess? Yeah, I mean, the only other people in this setting would be the other disciples. So is yeah. it referencing them? Yeah, that is, I think that's the obvious choice, but it's very interesting. Some read this and what they see is, well, remember this started with Peter wanting to go fishing. And so is Jesus asking Peter if he loves Jesus more than boats and fishing and the 153 fish on the shore and all that kind of thing. So that these would be his vocation, his long familiar family sort of vocation. Now, I don't think that that's the case, but it is very interesting that someone sees that, not just a single someone, many someones. It's more like, do you want to be a fisherman more than you want to serve me? So again, I can't really go for that one, but I at least see kind of how they got there. Now, some suggest it is the other disciples. And, and there, there's a, a nuance here, Samuel. This is more like, do you love me more than you love them? So now, I, again, I can see how somebody would get that from the words. But for me, I still don't see much sense in that. And I guess all I'm saying is that if, if Peter has any understanding at all of who Jesus is, well, it's not really a contest of where his affections should be. So I don't know. Seems seems like that can't really be what he means. And so uh, the other way that we might look at it is to say that, look, it's it's better understood as, do you love me more than these other disciples do? And is that what you were saying, Samuel? Yeah, it was either that or... The second one. The second one, yeah. 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 Yeah, and so the interesting little nuance there. And so, I mean, if you think about it, do you love me more than these other disciples do? It's an interesting moment. I, in my mind, I think that Peter, he's probably flashing back. He's probably flashing back to, you know, a moment kind of like what we saw in Matthew chapter 26, verse 33. Sammy, why don't you read that so that we know what we're talking about here? Peter said to him, if they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you remember Peter had those moments when it's like, I, I am going to be better than all the rest. Mm -hmm. You know, I am the faithful one. Right. And it's almost like there was always some part of Peter that considered himself better than the others. And, and if this can even be said, kind of, kind of like in the best way possible. He just wanted to be more loyal than anyone, more faithful than anyone, more willing to lay down his life than anyone. Not like, hey, I'm better than you, but just Peter just wanted to be the man. And, and so in a way, it's kind of an example of a good trait gone bad. And if you think about it, as far as we know, Peter is the only one of the 11 that actually denied him. I mean, <laughs> he he spent all this time trying to be number one, thinking he was, you know, I, I I am more faithful than the rest or whatever. And in the end, Peter's the only one that that denied him. It's like he's the worst yeah. of them. It's crazy. But Jesus, I think what we're seeing here is he starts through this, this, this first question. He's I think he's giving correction to Peter while he is restoring him. And that's very important to see, because what is the purpose of correction, Samuel? Uh, repentance, like act, genuine change in yeah. someone's actions. Yeah, and ultimately, restoration. The purpose of correction is to restore. And so Jesus is correcting Peter, and, and Jesus is restoring Peter. It's kind of neat. And again, we can learn a lot from this, especially in how we treat others. 
We need to have the right goal, the right motive at, at heart and, and treat people accordingly, like we see Jesus doing here. It's kind of neat. Now, to finish the thought, though, here, Peter responds in the affirmative. You know I love you. And this is kind of cool because, I mean, on one hand, who knows better than Jesus? I mean, he, he's predicted and known things about people like crazy. And Peter knows this. But look at what Peter's doing. He's kind of deflecting. Hmm. Do you love me? Peter's afraid to really just go out. We're, we're seeing some more of something being off with Peter. He kind of takes the safe bet. He chooses Jesus's knowledge over his own. You know, I love you. It's just, I don't know. I think it's kind of neat. And Jesus gives him a simple command. Feed my lambs. And what we see in this, now think about it. The lambs, who do they represent, Samuel? I mean, the people, the nation of Israel. Everyone who's actually, yeah, believing in Messiah, accepting, serving Messiah, whatever you want to call it. Feed my lambs. And, and also, what he could be saying is, hey, be done with this whole competing thing, trying to be the best. Just provide for all of my disciples. Now, in the future, as long as, as long as you are able, feed them as if they are my lambs. And when we say feed them, I think maybe people make a little bit much out of these words, but I think it's easy to associate this word feed with something along the lines of teach or instruct, feed my lambs. So Peter, on one hand, he's being restored as a disciple. And I think that's for Peter's sake. He felt like he blew it. But we can see in this that he's also being restored to a position of leadership. And what's an important thing about being in Jesus's kingdom, Samuel? Leaders do what? I mean, they're participating in the kingdom with Jesus. They're serving him, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And that's the thing. Leaders, okay, sure, they kind of sort of lead, but it's not the way we think of leadership so much here on the earth. It Leaders serve. And even to the point of laying down their lives, sometimes like literally physical laying down their lives and sometimes just as a, as a way of living. Now, we might even view this, let's call it a new shepherd-like calling as uh, opposed to the fisherman-like calling. A uh, shepherd is, you know, more like taking care of the flock, whereas a fisherman, I don't know, you might think of that as uh, growing the flock, like evangelism, that kind of stuff. I think on the whole, we should view this as kind of a step up for Peter. So one more thing we got to talk about here, Samuel. Uh, let's talk about the word love. It's become quite popular to make a big deal out of Jesus using the word agapao and Peter using the word phileo. And I got to tell you, it makes for some great sermons. However, we need to keep something in mind. We got to remember that when this conversation was happening, Peter and Jesus probably weren't speaking in Greek. And I'd put that as a, a really high percentage that they were not. It was most likely Aramaic, possibly maybe Hebrew-ish, but Aramaic is the, the far most likely language. Now, we could have a discussion about, hey, maybe both Peter and Jesus, maybe they had some ability to speak some Greek, but it, it definitely wasn't used for normal everyday conversation. And we might even look back. What it, Remember when Jesus spoke to Pilate, Samuel? Mm -hmm. Do you think he spoke in Aramaic? I mean, he could have been speaking that's, Greek right there. Yeah, that's a right? good question. Yeah. I mean, we, so we don't really know, but the point is Greek... Even if they maybe did know some, it's just highly unlikely it's what they were using here. So Greek has five words for love, but Aramaic does not. And so if we're looking into this to see some sort of special meaning in the Greek word choice, well, you're kind of ignoring the facts of the situation. Now, Another side note, even though Greek has five words for love, 
there's a lot of Greek text available from this time, from this era. And those five words get used interchangeably a lot. We look at it and we're trying to make a really big deal out of these different meanings. But in the Greek, they, they didn't seem to use it quite so much that way. They, they were willing to throw any old word in there pretty much at any old time. So that's another thing. And then here's another thought, Samuel. If John's gospel was originally penned in Greek, which we don't know, but based on whatever evidence we have, that's kind of everybody's best guess. Okay. But if it was, maybe John, the writer, maybe he was trying to make a point with the word choice. But even that, is a little bit suspect because that's just not so much the way Greek was being used or not those five words in the Greek were being used. So the the thing is, remember all these sermons that have been preached about, oh, well, Jesus was saying, you know, unconditional love and, and Peter was just talking about, you know, friendship kind of love. Well, there may have been many, many good points that have been preached with regard to these words all along history, whatever. And I'm not saying that's bad. There's no reason to throw all that away. I'm just saying you need to hold it in balance with the reality of the situation. Don't overread what's in the text right here. Peter and Jesus are not having this strange little passive aggressive war of words. They're just talking. We we might be able to pull a little something more out of the text but don't go too far and think that it's Jesus and Peter having a little war battle, a word battle type thing. Okay. So anyway, I know that was a lot on that part, but anything there, Samuel? Yeah. And what you're speaking on, we have to think about the totality of what we've seen in the text concerning Jesus's heart and his character that he has displayed both in his interactions with his disciples and the public in general, Jewish leadership, etc. I mean, make no mistake, he definitely, there were moments where he was animated and filled with passion and conviction for things that he thought was right yeah. in, in terms of what his father in heaven wanted for his people. But it's just, I don't see in Jesus' character if he, if he and of course he would know because he's God. Like if you have a character such as Peter that probably is dealing with shame and guilt and just yeah. probably just carrying this immense weight of letting his master down, his rabbi down. <laughs> yeah. And in what way would being antagonistic or interrogative in this conversation doing subliminal word play like <laughs> that I, to me I I get a sense of Jesus wanting to be understanding and gentle and compassionate yeah. with with Peter he's wanting him to experience grace and forgiveness to get him to get back on his feet to prepare himself for the next season of his life and mission as you know the chief apostle of the master. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just don't think it's consistent with how we've seen Jesus approach times where people are experiencing brokenness and how he goes about addressing it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're bringing up a very godlike character, which it's important for all of us to remember every once in a while. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. Hmm. You know, so that's exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. Okay. Well, I kind of cut us off in the middle of that story. So let me finish it here. We're in John chapter 21, verses 16 and 17. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. All right. So Jesus turns right around and he repeats the question. Now, now this time, when, when he asks the second time, he leaves off a little bit of the phrase that he used in the first one. He doesn't say more than these, just says, do you love me? So, I mean, in a way, we mentioned this before, the, the element of competition has kind of left the picture. And you might see in this that the real point is for Peter and Peter alone. The, the question is, Peter, do you love me? Forget everybody else. Do you love me? Now, Jesus, he, he, he has a, a command again, kind of like he did the first time. And this time he uses the word tend instead of feed. And boy, people have made a lot of a big deal about this as well. And I, I think this is another one that's kind of been overblown. Now, we can look at the word feed and we go, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, symbolically, you could see how that leans a little more towards something like teaching and instruction and the word tend. Okay, that one is something a little more like, I don't know, gathering, herding, H-E-R-D, herding, caring, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. But both words really represent aspects of simply being a shepherd. And, and, and I think, in a sense, Jesus is, in fact, saying the same, ta- the same thing three times in a row. Okay, slightly different word. Maybe he is, you know, slightly highlighting a different aspect or something. But mostly, I think he's just saying the same thing. He wants Peter to be intimately involved in shepherding his flock. So, I mean, this, this is actually, it's, it's a beautiful moment. Whatever doubts, you talked about this, Samuel, whatever doubts Peter may be having about himself right in this moment, well, he's at least trying, but let's say they're, they're just being dismissed by Jesus. You know, it's, it's almost like he's, he's giving him permission to, to, you know what, let all that go and just start over right here, right now. I'm counting on you. Had to be a wonderful moment for Peter. Except <laughs> Jesus then turns around and asks yet a third time, do you love me? And for whatever reason, Jesus returns to the word feed. Okay. I, again, we shouldn't make too much of that. I think the, the basic story is, you know, be a shepherd. Now, at the very least, uh, we could at least say, that, well, you know, proper teaching and instruction is an important part of shepherding. Shepherding. And I don't know that if it's the word feed twice and tend only once that we're supposed to go, oh, yeah, you're supposed to teach and instruct twice as much as you care for people. I I don't think we're supposed to do that with it. But, But I would say if this hadn't come clear to Peter yet, if not before this moment, at least now in this moment, it had to be that Peter actually recognized, or maybe we would say became certain that this whole little conversation, this this little, I don't know, kind of game they were playing, was actually related to Peter's earlier denials. How many times did he deny him, Samuel? Three. And how many times is he being asked to shepherd his the, the flock? Three times. Three times, yeah. So, the the whole denial thing, well, that was probably Peter's lowest moment. But Jesus is reversing that moment, the three denials, with three affirmations. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. Now, still, Peter is grieved. I mean, he's probably, you know, it's it's bringing that whole moment back up. He's probably a little sad. He's probably a little angry at himself, all of it. Not only had he denied Jesus three times, he did it after proclaiming right there in front of God and all the other disciples and just everybody that he would follow Jesus even unto death. 
even if no one else would. So it's important to see the connection between that moment and this moment. Peter is being restored. So it's really kind of cool. Got anything there, Samuel? Yeah, a couple things. The first is, and I mean, we don't know with certainty or complete confidence whether this was the only interaction that was said between Jesus and Peter, maybe in this more private setting. There could have been more said, but I I really like the simplicity of this account between the two of them because I, I'm just talking from experience and thinking from experience whenever I have blown it, especially not just with God, but like my fellow neighbor, whether it's my spouse or my friend or family member, whatever, oftentimes in the aftermath of blowing it, I f- whenever I come near that person again, I interact with them after that event, I, f- I feel this need to like explain myself or try to over apologize for my wrongdoing. Right. And I just, I don't get that sense here in the text. It's like Jesus maybe is trying to simplify things for Peter with probably the multitude of things that are in his head concerning his identity as a disciple of Jesus, like what his role is going to be going forward. Yeah. And Jesus just, just simplifies and asks him like, what is your foundation? Like, do you love me? And then like that confirmation, like if that's true, if that is what your, your f- core identity is in terms of what you stand for in your life, then that's p- enough. you know, pick your, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and let's get back to work. Yeah. Like putting the world back together. Um, and I think the same concept and dynamic is true for us as well. It's like the, the grace and the merit of Messiah is overflowing. It's unlimited for us. We should never take advantage of it and try to abuse it, but it's there for us. And then each time that we need to go to him for that, the response should be, yeah, it's there. A reminder that who is it that we're loving and we are being loyal to. And then let's get back to work in terms of, uh, Takun Olam, like putting the world back together. So, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know how much I'm reading into the text, but I just, that came to mind when you were speaking and I think it's, it, it's got some power for me at least. Yeah. Oh, I think that's really good. You're right. There's probably a bazillion things going through Peter's head and in so many ways that he wants to change it, fix it, remove it. I, I don't even know what you want to say, but in the end, Jesus is just going, Peter, there's only one thing that matters here. Yeah. Do you love me? Yep, that's enough. We're good. Do you love me? Yep, that's enough. We're good. You know, it. Mm-hmm. I don't. It, it's. It is. It's a neat thing. It's a neat thing. Yeah. Anything else? And then the yeah, the other quick thing is your statement about Peter probably still being grieved, being a little sad, a little angry at himself. I think that's also very poignant and important because I don't think within these three questions of Jesus in asking Peter if he loves him I don't think there's any sort of like uh, soothing in terms of like oh man Peter like I want you to get to a point where you don't think about what happened and that you can just completely erase it from your memory I think that 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 lowest moment of Peter's life needs to be something that he is still able to look back on as a turning point, yeah. I guess, for him in terms of repentance. Like, if we don't have that recollection of where we were so that we can see what we have come through and where we have ended up at the present moment, there would there would never be growth. There would never be progress in terms of us right. pursuing and putting on righteousness. So I think that's important for me to realize and hopefully listeners as well it's like i'm not suggesting that we like dwell on the bad things that we choose to do or that happen to us but it shouldn't be something that we 
aim to just completely be am, amnesia like in terms of our memory. We need right. to have those as a pillar so that we can know that's the line that we do not need to cross and we need to do everything in our power to to go the other direction than that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's I we may have said this sometime on the podcast in the past, can't remember. It's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Mm. If you remember back and feel condemned or you know allow yourself to be condemned, you become ineffective, useless. It, it it stops you in your tracks. But if you look back at the exact same thing and and it's not condemnation, but it's conviction, it's like a motivating force that allows you to move on and and actually get back to work. So yeah, I think you're I think that's good. Yep. Anything else? No, oh, in the words of Andy Dufresne, get busy living or get busy dying. <laughs> that's right. All right. So let, let's go more here. John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Okay, so Jesus, you know, he's been using this moment to correct Peter, to restore Peter. We've talked about that. And now, kind of, I would say he's sort of commissioning Peter, giving him a task, a mission, whatever. Now, Jesus didn't ask Peter or any of the other disciples to to literally lay down their life before. In fact, he was kind of protective of them, tried to keep them out of the trouble. But now it's changed. He's actually letting him know, yeah, this this is what's going to be required of you. And now what we see here, Jesus uses some strange, strange language. And maybe I shouldn't blame Jesus. Maybe it's John because he has a weird way of writing sometimes as well. So uh, I've decided, though, I, I, I'm going to do a little bit of a paraphrase here because I think that this is going to help because when I read that, I don't know. It's like the eyes on my brain just kind of gloss over. Let me say it this way and see if it helps at all. When you are young, you tie your own clothes around yourself. That is, gird yourself. And you walk wherever you want to go. But there will come a day when you are older, when you are going to be arrested. You're going to be tied up. And you're going to be carried where you do not want to go. So, again, I don't know if that's going to help you or not. I know for me, that's a much clearer picture. Peter has had a somewhat normal life. He will continue to have a somewhat normal life, have some autonomy. He'll he'll be able to do things for himself in freedom and liberty. But later, that's going to be taken away. He's going to be arrested. And of course... This is referring to Peter's eventual crucifixion. At least that's what John tells us this is about. And uh, by the way, Peter was crucified upside down. At least that's what tradition tells us. You know, some of these things, you just never know if they're true or not, whatever, but we'll go with it for now. Now, also here in the text, so uh, uh, contextually, uh, we might, we might be able to see some reason for the word choice of agapao versus phileo. And let's just say, let's say that John is trying to relate this story and that he's the one that's using these Greek words. And let's just say that he actually was trying to use them on purpose for some reason. Well, just thought I'd throw out one possibility. Agapao would definitely be the better word choice for someone who is willing to die for another. So Jesus was presenting himself as the one willing to die for another. And so maybe we can see in John's word choice here that Jesus is making an emphasis in this moment, in this conversation, where when he's asking about, do you love me? It's, he's really kind of getting at, 
hey, do you love me in a manner that makes you willing to lay down your life for me? And two reasons, because that's what's coming. And also, because that's kind of what you have blown earlier. Are you there, Peter? Are you ready to do this thing for real? Now, again, I don't think we should put too much in the, the word stuff, etc. But I don't know, that's an interesting picture. Just one. And then at the end of this, Jesus invites Peter one more time. And I don't know, it, it, it maybe it's commands. It kind of depends on how you read that. It looks a little bit more like a command to me, but whatever. Uh, this is very much like the first time way back at the beginning of their relationship. You would go back in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. At the end of all that, one of the things that Jesus says is, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This time, however, Peter is being asked to follow Jesus unto death. All along in the Gospels, Peter has been very predictable. His personality, man, it stuck out like a Thor song. <laughs> a sore thumb. <laughs> and so did my little bit of dyslexia there, huh? <laughs> but Peter has been so predictable, and right here, now, tell me, Samuel, if you think this is true. Right here, don't we expect Peter to say something like, oh, oh man, you can count on me. Heck fire, I'll die twice for you. <laughs> something, something crazy and bold. But he doesn't. We're, we're not going to see that here. It's just not. Something in Peter has changed. And it's pretty dramatic. And we're going to see more of it in the next little section. But before we go there, let's see what you got there, Samuel. A couple things quickly. Uh, should we jump to... No, nah, let's not say that phrase. Should we assume that Peter is aware that Jesus is referring to his death with this statement? Because, I mean, I know in parentheses, I'm, oh. at least the, the, the manuscript or in, in the interpreters uh, bringing it into English... It's an, it seems like an addendum, like this was to show about what kind of death he was to glorify God, in parentheses, E-N-D, end. But for Peter himself, in hearing that statement, he's like, oh, is, is Jesus telling me how I'm going to die? Or, or would this have been something that he wouldn't have really understood in the moment? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I got to say, if it wasn't for the text that follows, I think it would be the logical, reasonable thing to think that, no, Peter probably didn't know that, but John figured it out, you know, have watching it, if nothing else, in hindsight, right? However, as you'll see in the stuff that's coming up, uh, it maybe kind of sort of appears that he, he might have he got it. He might have known what he meant. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I, think we should, I think we should probably look at it as Peter picked up on it. Okay. Yeah. Anything that's else? That's interesting. Yeah. It, this is the the parallel is probably a stretch, but I think it's very telling that here in the same setting you have Messiah, God in the flesh, affirming Peter. It's redeeming him, so to speak, reinstituting him in terms of his role within the kingdom of God. Then yeah. at the same time, it, there's this solemn very real <laughs> revealing from jesus in terms of like even though that i'm affirming you and like you are destined to do great things like that does not mean that the story is going to end well for you um, yeah. and that you're not going to suffer and i that took me back to genesis actually genesis chapter 15 where and you, you'll just have to read the whole chapter, um, but you have God and Abram in this interaction. God's like trying to affirm Abram is like, like I'm your great reward, I'm your shield, and Abram's upset because this promise that he originally got from God in terms that he's going to be a father of many nations hasn't come to fruition yet because yeah. he hasn't had a child um, and his his wife is barren it goes back and forth and then eventually God causes Abram to fall into this deep dark dread vision so to speak and then he 
he foreshadows the upcoming suffering and slavery of his descendants in Egypt. And yeah. that's just, that's very interesting that you have the God of the universe affirming someone. And then when <laughs> someone's like kind of coming against that, so to speak, in terms of like wrestling with it, God's like, but let's keep in mind, it's <laughs> the world is broken and you're going to experience that in some way too, with me being yeah. present. So, yeah. Yeah. And again, that's another one of those, good reminders you know for everything that we face in life oh uh, yeah you know what we should say it again samuel christianity is a high high calling mm-hmm. and it's not all sugar spice everything yeah. nice right yeah anything else on that bit nope all right let's keep her going john chapter 21 verses 20 to 22 peter turned and saw the disciple whom jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So interesting. This, uh, well, first we should at least say, this is where I spoke earlier. We get the idea that Jesus and Peter were actually talking more privately while they were walking or something like that. So you sort of see that here in this bit of the text. Peter notices that someone is following them. As it turns out, it's John, the writer of this gospel. However, John uses some elaborate detail to let us know exactly who it is. Now, (laughs) it may seem at first glance kind of silly, superfluous, whatever, but I don't know. I think, Samuel, there might be something kind of kind of cross in it, something kind of salty, something kind of mean in it all. Almost like John is taking a jab at Peter. So, in first, he says it's the disciple whom Jesus loved, which, you know, we should all be picking up on that by now. We know it's John. He's talking about himself. But he refers back additionally to the Last Supper when they were trying to figure out who would betray Jesus. Now, back in that original moment, Samuel, who was it? Uh, Judas. Right. But here, John is trying to remind us of that same question. But now the only person in context is Peter. And I guess you could say that Peter has already betrayed Jesus once, if you want to say it that way, via the the three denials. And it's almost like John is raising this up again. Will Peter betray him again? Now, the weird thing about that is that John wrote this after the rest of Peter's life and death. He knew that Peter was indeed faithful. He knew how he had died. And so I think that John is is emphasizing that that at this moment. I mean, it, it wasn't so obvious. It wasn't so sure at the moment it was happening. But I I think we're able to see that it all actually turns out well. So I don't know. It's just it's a weird thing that John is doing right there. Uh, Back to your question, Samuel, if we accept the fact that Peter understands that he's being called to martyrdom, well, let's look at how he responds. Again, we said, well, you can count on me, right? That would be normal, Peter. But look at what he does. Well, what about this guy? Does he have to die for you too? And Samuel, this is so not Peter. I mean, I don't know. You got to even wonder is what's running through Peter's head. Maybe he's remembering a little bit from Mark chapter nine, verse one. Samuel, read the, the part I highlighted there. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Yeah. So maybe Peter's kind of looking at this going, well, 
I don't think that we all have to die. So if I do, what about this guy? Almost like there's just a little bit of competition, power struggle, something between Peter and John. It's very interesting. But anyway, Jesus, okay, he may be in the process of correcting and restoring Peter in this story. But we can definitely see that Peter is not yet corrected and restored. It's definitely a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And again, I I kind of feel like John is emphasizing that so that we can somehow fathom the gravity of this moment. So I don't know. It's kind of neat. The the other thing, and I, I don't know that I'm reading this correctly. Certainly other people have opinions, whatever. But it seems to me that even the resurrected Jesus seems to get just a little bit perturbed. I mean, if it is my will that he never die until I return, and I know it's not in the text, we could even turn it around, or that he also is to be martyred like you, either way, it doesn't really matter. The point is, what is that to you? What business is it of yours, Peter? You need only be concerned with what I am asking of you. That's enough. And Jesus repeats the command. And boy, if you had any question about whether it was an invitation or a command before, I think now that's all out the window. This is definitely a command. Mm -hmm. You follow me. But it's, it's even more forceful more personal than it was before. You follow me. And what is he asking him to follow into? Well, to one, shepherd the flock. That's a real thing. But also to be crucified for faithfulness. So it's it's asking a lot. But, But for Peter, you know, Jesus is basically saying, hey, this is the path designated for you. And that's enough. It's all you need to know. Just walk it. All right, what you got there, Samuel? Yeah, I I just really like your statement. It sums it up really well that despite this interaction that Peter and Jesus had together, Peter is not fully restored yet. Yeah. He's still a work in progress. And I mean, ultimately, he will, even though that, of course, he pursued righteousness and the mission of the kingdom extremely well, and we're like... You and I, Paul, being in Kentucky, talking about this now, it can be one of the fruits of his efforts, but um, he was still a broken, sinful person that had not been physically redeemed yet by God. Right. And I'm going back to Jesus' declaration of his fate. I can't help but think, you know, we had just talked about Peter may have been experiencing shame and guilt and this weight. And now you have this moment where Jesus is affirming him, reinstating him. But then right directly after that, Jesus lets him know like, oh yeah, like this is how you're going to die. Within that broken state in terms of like our our body and our, our bodies and minds not being renewed, I can't help but wonder like, I wonder if Peter like, in that moment was thinking like, oh, I know he just said all these positive things for me, but now he just let me knew, let me know how I was going to die. Like, is that because of what I did when I denied him? Oh, right. You know, and then made that maybe that led to him asking the question. It's like, what about, you know, this John? Man. Like, yeah. Yeah, like you had said earlier about people not tasting death. So like, does that mean yeah. that, I don't get to experience that because of my mistake and he does. And Jesus is like, again, he's simplifying. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like what matters is how you respond from your mistake. And that for you is to follow me and to tend my sheep. So yeah, yeah, it's just, it's it's, even now it's complex and there's layers present within here. But it's such a good lesson for all of us. In any time and in any place, you know, we, I think, we look too much to what other people are doing, thinking, whatever, and, you know, we try to, you should be like this, which really all we're saying is, you should be like me. (laughs) But 
you know, we need to, we need to focus on yeah. what God has before us run that race, you mm-hmm. know, and, and forget the other stuff. It's not to say we live in a, you know, with blinders on, but right. Have the right focus. So yeah, it's good. Anything else? No, I mean, just, it's, it's so convicting to see that like it didn't stick immediately with Peter and it's, it's <laughs> right. a reminder to me. It's like, even us as followers in present day, and I'm sure this was present over the generations, they we need to continue to preach the mess the message of God to ourselves, regardless yeah. of how long we have been following and how long we've been on this journey. Because oh, yeah. until sin and death have been removed, the law is not going to be completely written on our hearts on this side of reality. So it has to be a constant like injecting of God's word and standard into our, our conscience. Yep. Yeah. So true. So true. Well, John, he now kind of, I don't want to say goes off topic, but he sort of leaves that story with Peter. And now we get sort of like a wrap up of just some internal body of Christ drama or something like that. Right. So here's uh, John chapter 21, verse 23. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So here... I don't know, maybe we see even an additional motive for John including this story. Apparently, this story got mangled and people misunderstood that this disciple, we're talking about John, was not to die. He wasn't to be a martyr. And and John is correcting that. Jesus didn't say that he wouldn't die, only that it was none of Peter's business if he was to die or not. So. Obviously, I mean, we could reasonably think, well, John hasn't died before writing this, <laughs> right? So <laughs> he must have still wondered even about his own end. And as far as we know, John ultimately died a natural death. Now, I think we've mentioned this before. There, There's a lot of tradition. There's this story of John being martyred. John boiled in oil. I mean, we even have, I don't know what to call them. They're like pictures or paintings or some sort of image, whatever of it, you know, sort of representing this, this story, John martyred, boiled in oil. But as it turns out, his martyrdom was a complete failure because John walked away from it unscathed miracle of God, you know, all that stuff. Mm. So anyway, far as we know, he dies a natural death. Now, some suggest that John did not actually write this last chapter himself. Remember how at the end of chapter 20, we thought it was kind of like the end of John, Mm -hmm. but, but it wasn't really. So maybe he didn't write this last chapter himself. If so, whoever's writing it, we're assuming it's like his disciples or somebody close, whatever. Maybe they were actually trying to explain his death because so many people had bought into this story that, you know, he was not going to die before the master's return. So that's sort of a interesting little view of this whole thing as well. Can't really tell you what the truth is because I wasn't there, but it, you, you get the idea. Anything about that bit, Samuel? No, I did. that's just one of those things that's like it's there in the text. I take it for what it is, but I, I, I can't really make any conclusions about it because it yeah we yeah. don't we don't truly know what the purpose was for why it was included in in this right account yeah now just to get this out there real quick we are going to go a little bit over on time today and that's because scheduling and whatnot we we are instead of basing this episode on time we're basing it on what we wanted to include in it and so we've got a couple more little sections to go so we're going to go a little bit long it's okay you'll survive Hang in there. (laughs) Yeah. John chapter 21, verses 24 and 25. This is the disciple 
who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So again, odd language here. Uh, It starts out with something like, this is the disciple, okay? Now, for sure, we know that this is simply referring back to John. But what we don't know is, is this John actually writing about himself, or is this kind of a, a postscript that was added by someone else? And at first, it seems obvious that it's John, but it's actually a little bit hard to tell. And I'll explain what I mean here in a second. Either way, doesn't really matter. The point that's being made here is that this gospel is the work of an eyewitness, John. And I guess what they're trying to do is equate it with or put it on the same level as legally valid testimony. Okay, if we were in some kind of court, court of law, court setting, whatever, it's eyewitness testimony. This is legally valid stuff, okay? Now, but after it says, this is the disciple bearing witness, all this, then it says, we know. Well, who's we? On one hand, it could be that John is speaking of himself and the other eyewitnesses. This is disciple, you know, bearing witness to these things. We know that the testimony is true. Okay, me and all the other eyewitnesses, we know that. We were there. We know that all that's written here is true. Maybe. It could also be that the writer of this postscript is one of John's disciples. And so in that case, you would say, well, you know, he's saying that that they, he and the other disciples of John, They know that everything written here is true because they've been hanging out with this guy for presumably years. They they know he was an eyewitness. They've heard all the stories. There you go. And then a last possibility is John is the one writing. He's bearing all this stuff and he's sort of now just turning it around and being all inclusive. It could actually mean that all who read this and believe, which would include even us today, we know that it is true. So I don't know. You kind of have to take your pick. It, it's it's difficult because the fact that we have two endings makes me think it's not John. But hmm. because of the lingo and the way chapter 21 had some weird stuff in it and this and that, it reminds me very much of John. So I don't know what to think about it. But, you know, you've got options you can pick for yourself. And just to finish it up, we get this this second ending of John, which... I think, is surprisingly similar to the first. The first ending highlights all of the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus performed that didn't get included in the gospel account. This second ending that we're doing right here, well, it highlights all of the many things Jesus did that aren't included in the gospel account, and and that means uh, they could have been miraculous or maybe not. It, It could have been teaching moments, or it it could have been anything, everything. And so all of it is important. So the idea is that even with all that was written here in this gospel, it's a mere drop in the bucket. There's so much more that could be told. And to emphasize the point, we're told that if it were all written down, there would be so many books that it would fill up the earth and even overflow it. So today we would imagine that as, uh uh-oh, books floating in space, right? (laughs) But, you know, kind of cool. A final little bit of hyperbole for us, Samuel. What do you think of that? (laughs) Yeah, can't get enough. So that's the end of John's gospel. We've got one more little section that we're going to do, but Samuel, do you have anything to add here? Yeah. uh, Did you notice that whoever the writer is when verse 25 uses the first person? uses the pronoun I. I know. I, I, yeah. I, I feel like that's got to be the only time in the whole book where the writer is speaking in first person because usually <laughs> when, well, I mean, I mean I'm point. serious. Like when, when yeah. John is referencing himself, it's always the disciple whom Jesus loved. So yeah. Yeah. it's either 
John, if he did write it, is now switching the vibe in terms of wanting to address the audience directly rather than indirectly as a narrator. Right. Or, like you said, there is another author involved, and this change in pronoun is potentially a evidence really for big that. Signal. So that's I, right. That's uh, just interesting to me. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. If you were looking for reasons that it wouldn't be John, that's a really good one. Anything else? Nope. Let's get this next section All right. going. Last little bit. Now, what we're going to be reading from is uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 and 17. And I've actually got this paralleled with Mark chapter 16, verse 14. I'm going to read Matthew, and I just want to remind that when we're looking at this particular stuff from Mark, this is the added extra long ending, and that we we don't really give a lot of uh, credence to it. So anyway, let's go ahead and read and talk about it. Matthew 28, 16, 17. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, so the sequence might feel a little bit weird uh, because in what we've been doing, they've already been in the Galilee. I mean, they went fishing. They had a meal with Jesus, a lot of stuff. And who knows? Maybe it was at their little fish breakfast that they they made up the plans for meeting in this little episode, or maybe not. See, the last thing that we heard from Matthew was about when the guards were being bribed. Oh, say that they stole his body, right? So there's a lot that happened in between here. So in a way, it could just be that, well, no, this, this is just Matthew's text kind of playing catch up with where we've gone everywhere else in the story. So anyway, The mountain to which Jesus had directed them, many believe this to be the same place as the Sermon on the Mount. And and some, as an alternative, some even think that, oh, no, no, it's the place of the transfiguration. Now, for me, this seems really unlikely because I don't go with what was a long time traditional location. You heard us talk about it. That's pretty far away. I don't think that that has anything to do with this story. Mm. So, you know, we don't know where it was, but you know what? It's a reasonable guess that it was the same place as the Sermon on the Mount. So, you know, we can accept that. Can't really know. It's not worth arguing over. Uh, But here's the, I don't know, this part that I think is so interesting, Samuel, they worshiped him. And now this is, is the idea of kneeling down, bowing down in reverence. It's that kind of worship, not sacrifice or whatever. I'm sure that was obvious to everybody. But Matthew adds that some doubted. Mm. I, I read stuff like that and it just floors me. Now, let's be clear. This word that we're looking at here, well, it's more like a wavering or hesitation or indecision. It's something more along the lines of, I can't believe what I'm seeing, as opposed to plain and simple unbelief. So so I hope you can see some distinction between those two words. Uh, it's the more wavering hesitation and decision part. But still, it's very difficult to look back and imagine that after all they've seen, all that they've heard, that they could still doubt something, but some of them do. Now, I think in a way, this is, this is very good for us. It helps us see that, you know, maybe we need to just be a little easier on ourselves. Maybe we need to be just a little bit easier on others. If these guys could go through all this and still have moments of doubt, even if it's just indecision, hesitation, whatever, if they could still do it, well, we need to we we need to maybe accept doubt as kind of an an okay place to visit on occasion. It's 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 definitely not an acceptable place to stay, right? Staying in that place of doubt. But it's very understandable 
that we might find ourselves there on occasion. And of course, you know, we, we need to find a way out of it. And remember, this is important. This whole story is supernatural, meaning it's not natural. And so is it really so crazy to think that we would have a little trouble accepting some of the things that we see and hear and try to understand now and then? I think it's fair. So, you know, maybe that could encourage somebody. Don't know. And then finally, just to sort of cover it, we included, you know, Mark's added ending here. And Mark, Mark has them eating together instead of out on a mountain. And Jesus is rebuking them, which, wow. Okay, that's a different kind of emotion, attitude, whatever. Now, some, and I think this is reasonable, they'll place this text back with the return of the Emmaus guys instead of where we have it here. And, you know, I I can't can't really argue it one way or another. This is more of a, yeah, this is kind of the way all of the you know, read the Gospels in in order, kind of put it, so I'm going with it. But, you know, there there is a difference. Jesus's words and demeanor here are really quite different, quite different than they were, you know, in the room when they were all locked in and Jesus just shows up, quite different from what we see in Matthew's account, if, if it's a parallel thing, whatever. In Mark's version, uh, here's the other thing. It isn't wavering or hesitation or indecision. They really are unbelieving and Jesus doesn't like it. In fact, he's kind of being HR gruffin stuff with them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he, he doesn't like this at all. So again, that doesn't make it right or wrong, but we already have a bit of a, we're not too keen on the whole thing. So for right or wrong, we're not giving a whole lot of credence to this last bit of Mark. I just want to make sure that it gets covered on sort of the just in case. So that's all we're going to try to fit in here today, Samuel. What do you got before we go? Yeah, I just want to point out that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Yeah. Um, It's apostasy. It's walking away from the faith. And um, there's this quote by, there's this author, I can't pronounce her name, her last name very well, it's a uh, Madeline Langle. She, she, her famous book was a wrinkle in time, but, um, she has this quote on doubt that I find really good. She said in an interview one time, the value of doubt is to keep you open to God's revelations. If you don't mm. doubt, you don't change. Uh-huh. Um, it's a, it's like a natural process for us to come to, a realization of who God is and what his truth is about. So use it, use doubt in your life as a tool, like getting to a spot where you're comfortable to wrestle with things that make you uncomfortable in your spiritual life can actually be something that helps you to take a step forward rather than what the church maybe has taught you up until this point that there's something wrong with your faith if you have doubt. Um, so yeah. that's good. I like, really like, like that. you said, have, have empathy for the guys that, who were doubting what, what it's saying here in the text. Like we don't know how miraculous and supernatural all this would have felt to them. And it, I would have been pinching myself and questioning whether it was all real or if, if I was dreaming it, um, yeah. if I was in, in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Anything more? No, that's it. All right. So again, we did go really long. I bet you that this is our longest episode ever. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're sorry for that. But uh, again, it's because we're trying to schedule. We're trying to get in just one more episode. And I don't want to say too much. I think I've learned in my life. You just sort of hope for things. Uh, If everything works out. Samuel, we're going to have a special guest on that last episode. Yes. So let's hope that everything yeah. does indeed work out. This is a new type of cliffhanger for our listeners. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Come back for the Gospels finale. That's right. That's right. All right. Let's get out of here. Okie dokie. Oh! Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. 
You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.